The Moto Academy and Jet Lawrence have partnered to bring you the world's most interactive online motocross training tool and VIP fan experience. Inside of the app, you guys will have access to tutorial videos for first time riders all the way to the professional level. You can message AJ and I directly on the app, send some videos, we can give you tips and tricks to advance your riding at the end of the day and be an all round safer rider and faster. Subscribe before December 18th and we'll be picking out one lucky winner to win a Honda CRF 250 and a trip to Jet's hometown to hang out with Jet and myself for a day of training and riding. So head over to motoacademy.com and subscribe today. Yeah, welcome to the latest episode of the Racer X Exhaust Podcast. I'm Jason Wygant here. This show brought to you by Yoshimira Exhaust Systems. Go to Yoshimira-RD.com for the latest exhaust systems for your bike, regardless of what brand you ride. Whether it's factory-level stuff that they develop for Honda, including Jet Lawrence, who we'll talk about in this podcast, or if you have a Kawasaki or a Yamaha or a Husqvarna or a KTM, Suzuki has deep roots with Yoshimira. Check them out. They've even got good stuff for street bikes, side-by-sides, you name it. And also the cycling line, including the pedal the Chaleo pedal, am I saying that right? I have it on my mountain bike. I like it. Don't need clips. They're really good. Go to YoshimiraCycling.com for more on that. And also brought to you by Onyx Maps. Over 500,000 miles of trails have been mapped out for you. It's a great time of year to use it. Onyx actually is developed originally as a hunting app. Maybe you're into that. Go to Onyx Maps and download the hunting version of the app. Or go to Onyx Off-Road in the App Store to get specifically the trail version well, you'll learn where you can ride your dirt bike, your mountain bike, go hiking on and offline. You can download the maps and public and private lands are shared a lot more detailed than you get on Google Maps. So check out onxmaps.com. Now, today we're going to talk to AJ Cat and Zero. This is predominantly because AJ Cat and Jet Lawrence have launched a new online training teaching protocol program via an app, the uh, Moto Cross Academy. But that's not really the point here. My point more so is to see how Cat and Zero, a privateer who's always just on the verge, right? Like a borderline main event guy. Is he going to make a living in the sport? Is he not? Like right on the edge. How he has carved out a place to make money and really do well with his career without having the factory ride, without winning the races. And I always think that's a refreshing story to see how big the industry could be and how many jobs there could be in it. You've just got to be an entrepreneur. And Cat and Zero absolutely is. You'll hear Lucas Myrtle, that name mentioned Lucas Myrtle in this pod. Lucas is the super agent for the Lawrence brothers and many others in the sport. And Lucas is an Australian. He's outspoken. He'll tell you it straight. He doesn't compliment people automatically. Uh, but he told me last week, he's like, look, I saw the program that AJ had put together with his riding schools. And I don't know if it was going to be possible to build anything better than that. So if you're wondering why would Jet Lawrence, who has all this cachet, all this marketing power, why wouldn't he just do his own thing if he wanted to do riding schools and an app and, and, and make money that way? Why wouldn't he do it on his own? Because it's hard to do better than what AJ Cat and Zero has already built. So that's that program. We have a breaking news link on racerxonline.com, but I wanted to talk more about AJ and how he has found his role here in this sport. So that's what we'll cover mostly in this pod. Now, also some breaking news today, Zach Osborne, his on again, off again, on again, off again career is now back off. So over the summer, we insiders had heard that Zach's back was not going to get better. And I saw him at Unadilla and he was at peace with the decision that he was going to announce his retirement. And then the back started to get better and they didn't announce his retirement. And then Zach said, actually, I'm good. I'm going to try this again. I'm coming back. I figured out ways to fix this and I'm going to race in 2022 and then one day we i'm on a text thread i think it was mathis said hey zach how's the riding going and zach said actually it's not the back's not gonna work i'm gonna have to call it and then today that news officially came out so it's a little less shocking because we had already started to hear that zach wouldn't be back two months ago 
then we heard he was back again, but we had already began to process that this might happen. Look, it's never good when a rider is retiring because of an injury. This isn't a catastrophic injury. You know, it's not, you know, he's going to be able to ride a motorcycle. He's going to be able to play with his kids and all that stuff. It's not horrible, horrible, catastrophic injury. But still, Zach wanted to race, and his body would not allow it anymore. So that's always a little bit sad. But remember, Zach's been around the world a bunch of times. He's got a lot of miles on the odometer. He's accomplished a lot. He's ridden a lot. You could easily say the last five years of his career, it's all been bonus time, right? Like to even get to the level that he eventually got to, to win as much as he did, the championships that he won, that was not a foregone conclusion that was going to happen. So he was just squeezing the, all the juice out of that fruit that he could. It's inevitable maybe at some point that you're just not going to be able to get all of that out of it. I mean, he got a lot out of his time, 16 years as a pro. Just a bummer, though, because I think everybody like Zach, he was... On the media side, obviously very open and honest and understood our role, understood his role as an athlete. That's certainly great. You don't care if he makes my job easier. I think the fans certainly respected the work ethic. He's a family guy. And you knew that when you saw Zach out there, he was giving you everything he had. And that gets kind of universal respect. There was a brief period where the rough riding, the, the tag that Kawasaki had hung on him when he ran into AC and he ran into Savachi, that probably haunted him a little bit. But that's pretty far in the rearview mirror, and I think there's just universal respect for Zach. And you never want to see contenders no longer in the races, right? That's never fun. So we've lost that, and that's going to be a shame. One less good guy in the gate in 2022. How badly would you have loved to see fit, healthy Osborne versus fit, healthy Ferrandis late in a moto? Like, are there two guys that can dig deeper than that? That's unfortunate that we're going to lose that. But again, 16-year pro career, Zach's 32 years old. You can only feel so bad. We've seen much more tragic injury, career-ending situations than this. And I think Zach himself is a is understanding of that. He's done a lot. He's accomplished a lot. And anytime I've talked to him on this subject, he is shockingly uh, at peace with it, which is cool. Now, the only thing that I'm not at peace with is when the press release came out today from Rockstar Husqvarna, they wished him well. Good luck in the future. He's had a great career. Did great things for the Husqvarna brand. The press release said all those things. It didn't say anything about Zach working for the team. I don't quite understand that. You're never going to get anyone that's more knowledgeable than this guy, right? Like, what has he not done? What has he not seen? Both Europe and America, off-road. You know the guy loves all sorts of motorcycling. He'll try anything from a training perspective. I'm sure if you want to ask him about training and diet, he's got that dialed too race strategy. He was always a thinking man's racer. So that alone, and then, you know, the fact that he's, like I said, universally liked by the fans. So what a great brand guy he would be. I don't quite understand. All I can gather is that he doesn't exactly know what role he wants yet. And maybe they just haven't put those pieces together. But if we don't hear in a couple of months that Zach's got some job here on the side with Husky, I'm going to be shocked and I'm probably going to make fun of them for it. Because Unless I'm missing something, it seems like a whole lot of knowledge that you'd like to have on your side. I don't, I don't know why they would not offer him, you know, something big for the team. Trainer, coach, consultant, whatever, man. Very odd. That, that wasn't mentioned yet. We'll see. Okay, so that's the news of the week. Zach Osborne is retired. One less good rider on the gate for 2022. I did go to KTM last week. Probably saw the weed show. Check that out on YouTube chatted it up with some KTM folks because they are building a new headquarters out there in California. Not a factory. They're not building motorcycles in California, but they are expanding their presence. They're spending a lot of money to do it in California, which is a bit counterculture because Yamaha has moved a lot of their offices to Georgia. Honda is doing the same. Even on the car side, Toyota has moved to Texas. So the California trend is starting to go the other direction and KTM is all in. The only reason I'm bringing this up isn't anything to do with that. Just when I saw Roger DeCosta and talked to him, he went out of his way to say how well Marvin Muscan is riding. So we've lost Zach from the group, but the good news is that Marvin apparently right now, he's motoring at the test track. And we know that flying at the test track doesn't always mean anything, but you'd always rather hear, you know, more guys are doing well and coming into the season with a full head of steam than unfortunately the news you sometimes get in the Osborne situation uh, where someone's not even going to race at all. Okay, let's get on to our podcast here with The Cat. Longtime privateer AJ Catanzaro. Okay, we got the cat with us here, uh, running around like crazy because it is launch day for your new project. Um, but I, I kind of get the feeling that, okay, maybe today's a bigger than usual, but you've kind of been working this logistical game 
for quite some time. I think we see on Saturdays at a Supercross, and there's a lot more to your schedule than that. Yeah, well, thank you for having me, first yeah. of all. And uh -huh. there, there is, there's been a lot going on behind the scenes for the last five years. And at sometimes me not really knowing which direction necessarily to go, but knowing all, all at the same time, like, okay, there's more to it than just the racing. And there's way more money to be made than just the racing. And also my passion lies outside of racing as well with the teaching. So uh, everything that we're working on now and that's launching today is really a correlation of all of those things. And the timing has just been perfect. How did that work out? Okay, so I'm sure when you were turning pro, the goal was like everybody else, like I wanna be a factory rider and I wanna win races and that's how I'm gonna make my living. When did the schooling thing come about or did you always have that? in your mind, even in your younger days? No, I didn't. I, first of all, speaking of schooling, I had a really good education when I was young. So I think that naturally the people around me always had, I always had a bug in my ear, like, Hey, what are you going to do when you're done racing? And I was getting those questions when I was 17, 18 <laughs> years old, when I probably shouldn't have been getting those questions, but, uh, it, it had my gears turning like at a young age. And so I started doing classes and, and really small lessons with one or two riders when I was 16, 17, 18. All while like I was hardcore focused on racing at that point as well. But I just kind of always knew like, okay, maybe there's something else. And I'm glad that I had that mindset because it's taken a long time to develop what we've developed now, what uh, 10 years later. So. Yeah, give me a brief example here. First of all, you do riding schools. Then I know that it really became a thing. You have a lot of stuff on YouTube as well. So give me an idea besides this master class that's coming up of what you're generally doing up to this date. Yeah, so in 2016, I developed what was originally AJ Cat and Zero Moto X Academy. So that's when I developed a curriculum to really formally teach large group sizes. From there, we've now rebranded to the Moto Academy. It's grown in scale big time. I've traveled the whole world, like teaching these classes. And ultimately the, the conversations that would come up, especially with my wife, was how do, you, how do we get you home more? <laughs> really the, was really the big conversation. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> and wh where this stemmed from is she's a finan financial advisor. And she asked me, she said, AJ, how much money do you make? And I said, you know what, Allie, I have no idea. And she said, well, that's a problem. Okay. So she pulled up my calendar and we went through the last four months and this was a year ago. And she was able, we were able to do the math uh, just based on calendar dates and we could see where I was and what I was up to. And she asked at the end of that, what's your dream amount? Like if you were making X amount per month, you would be satisfied and you made it, so to speak. <laughs> and I told her and she, she did the math and she goes, AJ, you know, you've been doubling that consistently for the last four months. And I had no clue, <laughs> but my first reaction to that wasn't, oh, amazing, we made it. It was, Allie, this is not sustainable. I'm home two days a month. We can't have kids if we're doing this. Uh, so I kind of went to bed that night, like setting the intention of, okay, what's next? How do I, how, how do I structure something that is I you know passive income whatever that looks like where I'm not physically I'm one person and the knowledge that I have as one person I can, I can only be one place at a time and it was very frustrating for me I woke up the next morning to a podcast uh listened to the podcast and when this two hours was done I'm like this is it I need to do this I reached out to the individual in that podcast over and over and over I kept unsending the message on Instagram <laughs> um so uh, it didn't look crazy so okay. i would send it it didn't say seen i'd unsend it i'd send it again and eventually like four weeks later it finally popped up and said seen and i'm like oh he just saw it and uh sure enough he's a fan of dirt bikes and motocross and he thought that my vision was like aligned with his vision on on the app and he's just a, a big time web development guy he works closely with logan paul these are individuals that are really high level um, internet guys. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that podcast and listened to the way he was talking and now that I'm in with him, I see the vision of, of where everything's going long-term. Look at back up five years and see where technology was and then think, think to yourself, okay, in five years, what is technology gonna look like? 
and the app that they developed for me and for Logan Paul and these high level creators that they've developed it for, it will allow like in a very, very near future virtual reality where people could be attending a class from home where they could walk around the bike, they could see the way that I'm setting up uh, the attack position and doing these classes in person. The, the possibilities are endless and like this is just the beginning, but even with that being said, I, I still think we're kind of light years ahead with having the app and the user interface that the Moto Academy app is based on is, is really high level already. Um, it just, it's exciting. It, it's all escalated very quickly, but the vision has become a lot more clear in the last 12 months. Yeah, so we'll we'll get to how Jet Lawrence gets involved in a second, but this is more than just a bunch of riding videos then. This is not, hey, you can go to your YouTube channel, which is really good, and you can see some really cool stuff, and I've gone there, and I've watched, and I've learned. This is a much higher level, because it's an app, than just some videos of riding. Yeah, yeah, so it's got that as well. We have 100 plus tutorial videos that are very, very specific from first time rider, beginner, intermediate, advanced, all the way to the pro level with things as specific as like, how to tire tap or how to double up shift in the air all the way to like the most basic of how do you tie your helmet, right? Mm -hmm. So we have those tutorial videos that live on the, the app, but then we have a direct messaging system that supports video and photo sharing. And so riders can send in photos and videos to be analyzed where I can send back video responses. So essentially it's like a one-on-one -on -one lesson online. Uh, and then, shoot, there's so much stuff in this app. There's a, there's a whole <laughs> private, it's, it's really, it's, it's amazing. And what they've, what they've done is like, man, it, it's just so cohesive. It's so easy to use. I think in the past technology has limited us a little bit on like, I'm sure people have had this idea before, right. But you would go on and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, if you want to be a part of this, head over to the Facebook page and join the group over here and then pop over here. And it's just not easy to use. And it's not, it's not fun to look at. It's not easy to just pull up and click into on your phone. And this, everything lives in that, in that one place. Okay, so then how does the Jet Lawrence thing come about? I remember him appearing suddenly in some of your videos and some of your classes. And then here we are a year or so later uh, where you're both involved with this. So how does that happen? Uh, a little bit of luck. <laughs> okay, okay. So. <laughs> so my vision, once we had the app kind of dialed in and figured out was, okay, I need to partner with somebody that's really aligned with what I do. That's, that's very high level and has a notoriety and can kind of give this like the boost that it needs to get started. And once we have that boost, we're, we're going to be running with this thing. And I got an email from Honda to test the new 22, 250, which was completely aside from this. Uh, went out to Oregon to test the bike, got to hang out with Jet there. I also happened to do a class with Jet last year in Florida, which was really my first time meeting him. And right away, I sat down with Lucas Myrtle and I talked to Jet and Hunter and Dazzy, just the whole family, like Lucas included, when I say the whole family. They were just really down to earth and cool. I'm like, these are the guys. If I can get anybody, Jet, you know, Jet and Hunter would be it. Those guys are it. Not only do I consider them, to be like two of the most technically sound people on, on a motocross bike, but you combine that with the personality and then just truly being cool and down to earth. I'm like, man, if I could ever make this happen, this would be it. And sure enough, those guys were on board and, and, and Jet wanted to do it. And I was just like, you know, it was such a long shot for me to, to imagine that happening. You know what though? It's funny. Uh, obviously, yes, there's a bit of luck involved, but look, Jet Lawrence is on fire right now. I'm sure there's a thousand people that want five minutes of his time, let alone right. this level. Uh, so there's got to be something about, okay, you're saying they're down to earth and cool, but everybody thinks that. There must have been something about the program you were putting out there because they must have 999 other things they've rejected because everybody wants a piece. Well, and that gave me a huge confidence boost as well, right? Because in Lucas said, when we had the initial conversation, he goes, he goes, AJ, mate, we don't give anybody our time, period. And sure. I was like, no, trust me, I, I, I can understand that because I know how busy I am. I can't imagine how precious his time is and mm -hmm. as, a, as a manager, Lucas's time is for him. And, and also creatively, like 
I, I gel really well with, with Lucas Myrtle and like we, we go back and forth on ideas. And I think our initial conversations was just that, like brainstorming sessions. And he was impressed, I think, just with where my head was at with all of it. And that kind of just solidified things, right? It was like really just based on our first meeting and the first time talking that you could tell gears were turning in his head, like, okay, this makes sense. The timing's right. There's a lot of new people coming into the sport right now. Like there's no better time than to be releasing something like this on a big scale and to keep these people that are coming into the sport in the sport. I think we've had waves of this before in like probably 05, 06, 07, when things were popping, when I was like in my amateur career, right? When you would go to Minio's and it was just insane and local races were part like, um, you'd be down the road trying to get into the place. It was nuts. And you're starting to see that again, the last 12, 18 months. And it's like, in my head, the first thing I think of now that I'm more mature is like, we need to keep these people. Yeah. They can't be getting hurt and just selling their bike. I need to yep. make sure that they know how to ride safely, which the way that I teach it, it's easy. If you just listen to basic instruction and, and kind of put your ego aside, it, it's not that hard to ride a dirt bike with efficiency and to go just fast enough to have fun and to not kill yourself. Yeah. I always wonder what kind of feedback you get on that. Uh, I was talking to Lucas Myrtle the other day about this. It's the funny thing, right? So if somebody played in the major leagues of baseball for one year, he can probably the next 40 years be a coach and parents would be like, my kids working with someone who played in the majors and he could have been the 500th best player in the majors the one year he was on but everybody thinks he's in the majors. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Our sport is kind of weird. They rank like someone's ability. It's like, if you're not the best rider ever, how could you teach somebody else? So look, you're a guy who's made main events. So that puts you in the top 40, 50 in Supercross, right? In any other sport, that would be phenomenal. Do you have people say like, well, he's Cooper Webb is the only guy that should be able to teach me. That guy didn't make the main last week. Have you had to deal with that? Cause the sport is weird that way. Great question. Yes, yeah. a lot, a lot, but it's, I'd say it's more so like the internet trolls for lack of a better word okay. than anything. Yeah. I think you see less of that in person, even the 16, 17 year old kid that like would be the first one to try to act really tough and cool. Yeah. Uh, when I meet these people, I think they realize like, oh, wow, this guy's actually pretty nice and he's, he's friendly. And I do know how to ride a dirt bike. Like yeah. when you watch me ride in person, I know, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> right again you're a true um, professional like if you're the 40th yeah. best guy in the world in any sport you're really good yeah yeah. so i think i think even if somebody has that mentality showing up to class and maybe their parents made them go to class yeah all it takes is for me to be in my gear and steal their bike for a couple minutes at the beginning of the session and just be like okay this is how you do the jump and right away the, they go oh all right we, we get it now but that's, cool. that's the great thing about having jet is you can't say anything about jet no <laughs> you know? yeah. so so and that, this was the vision from the beginning was bridging the gap between the pro level and the everyday rider and being able to do that with somebody of jet's caliber is like i mean i said it before it's a freaking dream like i would have never imagined that we'd be able to make that happen and to me jet is just like not only is he amazingly talented on the bike and his technique to me is pretty much perfect. He's got the results now, but he's also had, he's cool. Mm -hmm. Like who else can pull out? He wears a pearl necklace. Yeah. <laughs> like, we don't even make fun of that. Like, yeah. come on, like who else could do that? And it looks cool. And it's like, it reminds me of Jeremy McGrath, you know, with like the bleached hair or the, when he had, he would always ride with the chain and he had the earrings. Like that guy was cool and he changed the sport. And if McGrath were, pro in 2022 i think he'd be doing the same thing that jet's doing right now this is just the natural next step like involving technology in it um i think a lot of the motocross industry is a little bit behind when it comes to those things same thing with the youtube right you saw a lot of people at least i did i saw a lot of riders making fun of the youtube thing at first and not taking it seriously and now guess what Chad Reed's got one. Justin Barcer's got one. Oh, yeah. Everybody's getting a YouTube and it's going to, that trend is going to continue. Luckily, I have a big head start on them. And we've also taken the next big leap with creating the own app. That's essentially creating your own platform instead of youtube.com slash 
the Moto Academy or slash AJ Cat and Zero. It's now the Moto Academy app itself. Yeah. So by the way, this is like a subscription based thing to get access to all this. Is that how this works on the on the ground floor? Yeah. So it's only twenty two dollars a month. Mm -hmm. um, so we wanted to make it super obtainable for anybody, and they could unsubscribe at any point if they wanted to. Um, but the idea is that we're going to keep uploading content into there constantly. There's a live stream feature, which I didn't mention before, where even before it goes virtual reality, they can at least watch the live stream and watch classes. Or if Jet's at the practice track, he could Lucas can live stream him while he's riding and coming off in between motos. So there's so many different applications for this thing, but I just want to keep the price point super, super low. So $22 a month, I mean, most people spend that in a couple of times at Starbucks, so. Yeah, and also I want to mention, look, you've hosted riding schools for a long time. You know how much an actual in-person riding school costs. Uh, it's a lot right. more than $22. <laughs> right, and this is a good opportunity for people to keep the tools sharp consistently. They could send in GoPro footage, they could send in third person footage if their mom or brother or whoever is filming from the side of the track. And all it takes for me is to see a couple seconds of that and be able to give really good feedback that they can utilize the next day that they go to the track. Um, so for, for the rider like that would be spending the money normally 200 bucks, 300 bucks, a thousand bucks for a week at MTF, whatever it is like, there's a lot to be gained from this $22 a month. Real quick break in the show to bring up Racer X. We have a magazine every month. I just completed yet another story on the crazy Waterworld GNCC. That'll be out in a few weeks. I called a bunch of industry guys that raced in this final GNCC uh, a couple of weeks ago and how nutso their races were. These are not pros. These are uh, magazine editor types. So that'll be the latest issue, and the issue that's out now wrote a story on Dylan Ferrandis being our Rider of the Year. All the stuff in the magazine you can now read on the website. So if you're looking at your phone, you could be reading the magazine stuff on your phone. But you have to be able to subscribe to access those articles. It's only 30 bucks a year, and we'll give you a $25 Rocky Mountain A to VMC gift card, and we'll mail you a calendar. That's about 5 bucks right there. So it's practically free. You know me. Free is for me. So do it. Go to racerxonline.com slash Weege. Thanks to Yoshimura and Onyx Maps for backing this show. Back to the cat. So see, that's another one of those things where, again, like the best player doesn't always make the best coach. Not everybody can see that. So you're able to, if someone sends you a video clip or you see somebody at a riding school, you can just watch them and you can start to pick up things with a fairly small amount of data, like they should try this or they should change that. An unbelievably small amount of data to the point where sometimes I send the, my response in and I'm so proud of myself that like, man, like I'm good at this. Okay. Um, Cause sometimes I get like a GoPro clip, right. And it's yeah. like, man, you can't really tell a whole lot, but if you pay enough attention or sometimes I'll even watch the shadow or, you know, you can kind of see their foot come into the, the picture if their foot placement's wrong or just line choice, whatever it is it's amazing how specific I can be with even the, or the grainiest photo ever. Somebody sends in like a video that looks like it came from a flip phone from 2002. And I'm still able to see it and, and give, I think really valuable feedback. And for me, it's a fun challenge as well, especially when I get that real grainy video and I'm just like, what the heck? what is this? <laughs> so that's a big part what of this. That? Like that's going to be part of how this app works, that interaction, even though it's not in person, they're still going to be able to get this. Absolutely. And that, to me, that's the first step in this. Like, I, I think I, I mentioned it briefly before. I really believe that like everything will be virtual. I mean, we see it with Zuckerberg and Facebook switching to meta and talking about the metaverse. Like this is no longer science fiction. This is going to be the future, I think, sooner than what we probably would anticipate. And I know that the guys that have built this app are on the forefront of all of that technology. So the idea is to like truly build a community online uh, in this app and have it have all of these features that can easily go into virtual reality, go into whatever it is that we, we need it to in a year, two years, whatever that looks like. Okay, two other topics I wanna hit. Does this, look, you're your own business, but does learning all this show you like, hey, there are other pathways in the sport. It doesn't just come down to make or break those 22 spots in the main. And that's the difference between either you've made it in the sport or you have not. Uh, it's your own deal. But is it kind of encouraging to know there are other pathways for privateer riders? 
Oh, absolutely. And even last night, I had an epiphany of another business, a very good business idea that's kind of uh, forked off of this current one. Mm -hmm. And I think the struggle is it just takes a little bit of momentum. And this can be applied to anybody in life, period. But for me, it felt like I was constantly taking two, like a step forward, two steps back for the longest time from, from age 17 to 24, 25, really. And it gets discouraging after a little bit. And finally, it was, the ball started to really roll. It was like, I, I would get some momentum these last, like, I'd say two years. And then a little bit more momentum would follow a little bit more. And all the while, I'm thinking to myself, like, oh, when is the setback going to come? Because <laughs> that was always it. It was mm -hmm. always like, oh, things are going well. Woo, nope. And we're right back to square one. Um, and that never happened. And knock on wood, I don't see that happening now. I think I've finally crossed that hurdle. And I know it's easy to say for somebody that's that's in a good place, but I just feel as though like, if you just keep working, even if it just doesn't feel like you know which direction you're headed, try to be creative, try to think outside the box, especially for people in our sport. Um, take that couple of hours a day. Instead of, instead of going on the Xbox and playing some stupid video game, use those two or three hours to be productive. Even if it's like searching YouTube videos to learn about business or to learn about um, just the way that you should be thinking, I, whatever that is, I, I think that I really come into my own, like I'm 28 now. I felt a huge difference the last couple of years just in my mentality in general. Um, I'm just in a good spot. It's exciting. And I, I do believe that anybody can get there. It's, it's upsetting for me to see privateers kind of stuck in the rut. And I just always try to remind them that like, hey, focus on the racing, of course, you'll only be able to race once. Before you know it, you're going to be 40 something and you're not going to be able to have that opportunity anymore. So take advantage of that. But you can simultaneously like pursue other creatives at the same time. Yeah, speaking of that, are you still racing? Is that still on your menu? coming up or how's that going to work it is but i, I it's kind of at the bottom of the tier of important things going on at mm -hmm. the moment so i plan to race i don't know how yet <laughs> i likely will just fund it my own which it, it it is what it is i'm okay with that um it just this year i wanted to actually be prepared the last five years i've come into supercross and just ridden once or twice before anaheim and kind of figured it out as the <laughs> season went and let's face it, like the competition's only getting more difficult, whether I'm racing 250 or 450, that's becoming increasingly more difficult to do. And although I have fun doing it, I have fun showing up and getting eighth place in the LCQ because my expectations aren't result-based. My expectations are to go out and to enjoy myself on the track, on the track, just to enjoy myself, like in the pit area, not that I'm not competitive, right. But the years that I was really unprepared. I wasn't showing up with false expectations thinking, oh, I'm going to go get 13th place in the main event. I, I wasn't. I was showing up thinking, okay, I'm going to have fun today. I'm going to do a couple cool rhythm sections and, and just try to get a flow and, you know, skim the whoops better than some of the other guys around me and just make little games to mm -hmm. make the day exciting. So long winded answer. Yes. I plan to race. I will hopefully after today. Cause yeah, on my phone, if you could, hear my phone vibrating right now it's going nuts uh, sure the app it just launched 30 minutes ago so i know the next couple of days are going to be hectic but then hopefully after that i can put some time into the race program all right well i appreciate you getting me on and and, and hooking up in the most critical juncture i just want to prove your coaching bona fides here here's something i don't understand why something has changed corners with feet on the pegs just explain what oh, has changed good question. why you had to stick your leg out by the front axle for 30 years. In the last three or four, it's become a game of who can put their foot out the least. Why is that changed? Why wasn't it always right? And why is it right now? Isn't that funny? Not yeah. okay. So this is the best explanation I can give because okay. my teaching overall is very open-minded. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm willing to accept that there's a lot of, there's different right ways to do it. Okay. I don't think that the foot out is wrong. Mm -hmm. I think that keeping your feet on is, is a more simplified way to ride. Mm -hmm. It's a more efficient way to ride. You get tired way less. It's way easier to be consistent. 
it's less dangerous because your leg's not out there to be susceptible to getting ripped and torn back. I tore my ACL in 2016 just by putting my foot out in a turn. Yep. And that was the moment of like, okay, I'm going to just leave this thing on from now on. Mm -hmm. And you see it really catching on. You do. Yeah. And what's funny is that MotoGP has kind of simultaneously done the opposite. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, because I think what motocross guys are realizing is that it's not when you, because the, the question is, why do you put your foot out? No one can really answer that question. <laughs> the, the best answer I've ever gotten is like, oh, well, it's just to maybe put weight to the front. I, I don't believe that because where you sit on the seat when you keep both feet on is more centered on the seat than when you put your foot out for a turn. So if you're sitting all the way up on the gas tank, essentially to put your foot out, because you're trying to get weight to the front of the bike, that would be way too much weight to the front of the bike. So it just doesn't, that theory doesn't make sense to me. And the better you get, it's all a confidence thing. Like when I yep. teach this at classes, once people realize, oh, I can just leave my feet on the bike, they, it, it catches on quick. And it's just like, we're wired. Our butts hit the seat, poop, foot out for yeah. no reason. Yep. Um, but that's funny you asked that. And I think it's especially in Supercross, you're going to see it this year. Because I see like high level guys practicing it a lot in the Supercross tracks now. You really don't have to take your foot off once. Wow. Wow. If that's you get really change. good at it, if you mm -hmm. get really good at it, um, I mean, why, watch me this year if I race. Okay. My foot won't leave the foot pegs ever. Wow. Not to say I'm the fastest guy in the world, but I'd say I look pretty efficient doing it. Right? Well, it just shows it can be done. Like doing a lap without taking your foot off. We would have thought that was impossible, but it's doable. It's totally doable. And it's just yeah. easier. So for 99% of the, the world out there that I'm teaching, I'm not teaching Jeffrey Hurlings or Ken Roxon. I'm teaching the person that's showing up on the weekends and wants to go a little faster than their buddies for bragging rights and be safe doing it. Um, and so it's just so obvious to me that feed on is, is the easier route for those people. Yeah. And I only ask but that because I, I see that evolution and I'm like, this is a guy who's probably right on the cusp of why this is happening, why you should do it. So I just always wanted to know. And I figured you're probably more keen to it than anybody else because you're paying attention to this stuff. A yeah. lot of people, a lot of people think that like, I'm the guy behind a lot. Like I, whenever somebody puts their feet on the pegs, uh, leaves their feet on the pegs in an yeah. Instagram post, I'm getting tagged left and right. <laughs> so it's nice that it, like, I certainly I wasn't the one who came up with that idea, but I intentionally kind of placed myself to be like, if I could be the face of it, fine, let me be the face of it. Sure, sure. All right. Um, yeah, your phone's blowing up. This is real. Uh, where, do, where should people go, by the way, to, uh, I know the info just came out so I can find it, but where should, what should people do if they're interested in this program? Yeah, easy. Themotoacademy.com. And then okay. all they have to do is click into club, subscribe, and they're right inside the app. But all thank right. you for having me. This is a big day. So I yeah. appreciate you. Yeah. Who knows? In five years from now, we could be talking about, man, remember what that launch day was like? And look at it now, right? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. It's escalating quickly. So who knows? Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. No problem. Get back to all the stuff you got going on. Always good to chat. Yep. All right. We appreciate yep. it. See ya.